Hello everyone, welcome back to the table. Today we're going to go over my review of Sales of Glory, Napoleonic's Wars. Uh, this, I'm just going to give you the short thought for those who don't want to watch the whole video. I think this is good. I think that if you don't have it, this would actually be a really good addition to your, your gaming repertoire. I have a friend, he said he got it for like a Christmas present, who knows when he got it, and he hadn't even opened it. Uh, and I'm like, wow, what a wasted opportunity. Uh, this is a really good system, and that's what I want to do, because I understand reviews really are matters of opinion. So, And that's why I hate calling it a review, but that's kind of what this is going to be. But I want to share with you why I like it, alright? So this is a positive review. I think this is really worth your time. Now, when I did the unboxing, I was pleasantly surprised to see a lot of people left comments saying that they did like the game or they liked the ship models, even though they used the ships for other things. Just, this is a real, real quality product. And it is by Ares Games, so they've also got, you know, Wings of Glory, so they have World War I, World War II. They also recently have the uh, Battlestar Galactica. And so I even thought about picking up the starter for that just because I kind of like the Vipers and the Cylons. Uh, but they all kind of work around a very similar core mechanic, but that just goes to show you the versatility of that core mechanic. They can tweak it for, you know, different genres. And so how does it work for Sales of Glory? I actually think this works out much better than it does for the other games. Now, I haven't played Battlestar Galactica, and I haven't played Wings of Glory, but I was watching people play those games for, you know, research, and just by watching people play, yeah, those are still good systems. I just think that that card-driven mechanic works really good in this setting. Because I've played like X-Wing, and, and you know, which kind of has those similar principles. And I don't know, I just think it, it really fits with this kind of um, age of sale. And, and we'll, we'll go into that. So let me go ahead and open up the box. Now... I did look on like Board Game Geek. There's actually a lot of support in the community for this. Now, how current is that support? I don't know. Because um, if you go look at files on Board Game Geeks, most of the files came out around 2014, 2015, kind of the release of the game. It seemed like people were really enthusiastic about it, and then maybe that enthusiasm died down. However, they did have to reprint the game recently, so sometime in late 2019, the base game came out again, and I was able to pick it up. Because otherwise, it was selling for like $200 if you could find a copy of the base game, and I didn't want to pay that. So, get it. It's out there if you don't have it. Now, I did leave some cotton in here. This is your, your firing effect. And um, so, speaking of support... I'm just going to go over and talk about a review as far as the base components and then maybe at the end we'll talk about some of the player aids I have found. But for now, just talk about what comes in the box. I'm going to take my cotton because that didn't come in the box. So what you get is four ships. You get, I think these are third rates. You get two third rates, there's a British and a French and you get like two frigates as well, British and French. And the way that they have everything stored when it comes is, is really great. It's packaged well. The ships, I, I have not needed to store them in a different way. Just putting them right here and how they came is great. Uh, this is how they traveled around the world and they stayed safe. So I'm just going to keep them right there. You then have the four ships. Uh, what they've done here is all these ships have different maneuverability ratings. So there was an A, B, C, and D. And that just kind of lets you um, determine the maneuverability deck. Because later on you might get some other ships that have similar decks and maneuverabilities. So some of these components I'm sure you could use with other ships. But if I understand correctly, each ship will come with its own maneuver deck. So as far as the base game goes, if you get your cards dropped and mix them together, at least you can separate them out by the maneuverability rating. Which is down here in the lower right hand corner so this is maneuver deck A. So if your decks ever got mixed together you can separate them out. But each deck does come with a picture, well a card that's got the ship on it. Let's just zoom in for a minute. Bing! And got a nice little picture of the ship. It has some of the ratings. This whole rating is kind of like its strength. 
Uh, there's the maneuverability of it, that's the A. This is the veer rating. Uh, this is deter determines basically how maneuverable the ship is and, and what cards you plan to use for uh, you know, plotting movement. This is approximately how many guns that it has and approximately the crew. I say approximately because I've learned uh, playing some other Napoleonics games, these are usually a rough estimate because sometimes the ship's crew, for whatever reason, might be understrengthed a little bit. This is like paper numbers. So uh, Now, the ship can be two, so it can either this here, uh, let's see, this is a Concord class, but you either have the, however you pronounce that in French, or you can flip it over and then you have this on the back. And usually the numbers are very similar. So it has like this, this one here, same hole strength, same maneuverability deck, same maneuverability number, the veer number. But this is 32 guns and this is 34 guns. Crew of 280, still a crew of 280. So just slightly different numbers. But it doesn't really affect anything in the game. Uh, which is interesting because the number of guns really don't seem to make a difference in the game except on, I take that back, when you have your ship data here that could have some bearing on the game. So I was only thinking because like when I play um, another game that number of guns, even a difference of two, might change your, your fire factors for shooting and so that could make a big difference. But I didn't see too much of a difference here. Anyway, rambling on at this point. All right, so you have, again, beautiful storage for the game. You've got your ship stored, and you have your maneuver decks. Now, what I did for the ships, though, I did have to tweak it a little bit. What I did with these ships is I did put a little bit of rigging on them, and I was trying to figure out how to do more rigging on the out edges of the sails and whatnot, and I'm actually glad I didn't because if I put it in here, there's these tabs here that stick up and it pokes into your rigging. So I try to cut it down a little bit. The way that these form factor for storage is, I don't think would be too kind to much more rigging than what I have here. So maybe later on if I come up with a better way to store and carry these, so if I travel and bring them, I can keep the ship safe and then I can have a lot more intricate rigging. But for now, cutting out those tabs, because uh, what happens is the tabs that were coming up between the sails was pushing on the rigging and I didn't want that. So I just trimmed that down. That's the only modification I did there as far as storing the ships. It's just trimmed down the little parts that were protruding up into the rigging. Then everything else stores in here just fine. So here we've got the ship boards. And the shipboards, well one, I really like the artwork on the game. I think it's very evocative. It does remind me very much of like Napoleonic's type of stuff. I, I just think it has that old fashioned, old timey feel to the artwork. So I think it's great. And the information on here is pretty detailed. I was trying not to make direct comparisons to other games because I didn't want to say why this is better than other games. I just wanted to, you know, talk about why I like this. I do have some games where a lot of this information is on paper. You have to write it out. You got to track how much crew you have and it's by a number. You got to keep track of, you know, which guns are loaded, how long it takes to reload, and all that is tracked on paper in terms of like turns and rounds, and phases. This does everything like that, but in a nice visual way. And since I'm kind of a visual tactile person, it's easier for me to see what uh, sail rating I'm at. I just have a little marker here. I can tell my crew. So instead of writing out on paper, okay, my crew is doing this, my crew is doing that, my crew is doing that, I actually have a counter that represents the action. So if I want my crew to pump water, I just put the pump water. I don't have to like write out pump water. So it tracks all the same information you have in a much more complex game, but it just does it with little markers and for me, being the visual person seeing it, I think it's great. I don't have to write stuff down all the time. Uh, same with like the ammo. I don't have to track, you know, I don't have to write down grape shot or double shot or anything like that. I just have a little appropriate counter that says, oh, this is what I have loaded. So the, the little play aid here for the ships I think are, are great. And I'll just set them off to the side. Then you got these two measuring sticks. Now, again, other games that I play, you're going to measure with like, um, you know, tape measure, 
which is fine because games might play in centimeters or in inches or whatever. But I have a friend that for, uh, I'm going to pull this out just a little bit, one of his Napoleonics games that we play as rain sticks. So this is not a new concept to wargaming, having like range rulers and range sticks with the bands marked off. This might make it feel kind of board gamey to some people, but um, it would be the same thing because my friend, he didn't have them in cardboard. He's made them out of out of sticks, and he just cut the sticks to lengthen, and he painted them to the range bands that he needed. So this is the very similar. If a person was really, really, uh, you know, hardcore into their gaming, do the same thing. Go buy a stick, cut it down to this length, and just paint it appropriately. So this is just a rain stick. So instead of having to carry around a tape measure, you've got this. And it works great. Uh, I think it's just fine. So you got two of these, it's one for each player or however you want to split it up. Uh, the only thing, there's not much granular granularity, I guess, in the damage where it's just out to here. It's all, you know, A. Uh, some games I play, the, the range bands are, there's a few more range bands. So cannonballs really lost effectiveness as they started to get out to the end of their uh, distance of firing and so you almost need a range band out here that's weaker to simulate the fact that those those shells have really lost an oomph by the time they've reached out here so I would say maybe that might be the only kind of drawback is there's not a lot of granularity in the damage that's alright though I'm okay with that it works it works just fine all right, now the rule book came in here and it still fits in here just fine. Gotta pull this out. Let me talk about this rule book. One of the things I found absolutely amazing about this game is the amount of detail and complexity that you can throw into this. And it's not a very big book. I've got a binder over here of another Age of Sail game that is huge. The difference is the binder game that I have actually includes a lot of background information to what sailing, like Age of Sail means, what does Napoleonic sea gaming type stuff means. It has a lot of background of, you know, what the different types of sails were. This has no background at all, other than the beginning is, you know, hey, this is Age of Sail Napoleonics. There's not a whole lot of fluff, if you will. So a person, I don't think you're going to learn a lot about ships and sailing and whatnot from this game. This really is boiled down to how do you play the game. But it's really well done. I love the fact that it's nice and full color, has good little examples in here. This is an amazingly well done rule book. I do flip back to the rule book on occasion to answer questions that I have, but it's easy to find the information that I need. I didn't think I would like this form factor of a book, but it works really well. And when I read it on my tablet, it fits perfectly to the screen size of the tablet. I don't have to scroll. So even when I carry this around electronically, it just works well. Now as far as the complexity, yeah, the basics of the game aren't that much. Move, shoot, there's no critical hits, you don't have to worry about changing cell types and things like that. But the amount of rules that this has is really good. Like for example here, just looking at the table of contents, I was really impressed by what they have in here. Uh, there, there's the rules for reloading guns. It takes time to reload. Uh, there's different shot types that you can choose in the future. In the basic game, it's just ball shot, but later on there is like the chain shot and like the grape shot. Uh, there's also a double shot. The only one I didn't see in here was a hot shot. I don't see a lot of Age of Sail games have the hot shot, but basically they could superheat cannonballs but you had to be very careful because when you superheated those balls, they would tend to expand. So either they'd get stuck in the barrels of guns. But when they worked, from what I read, they did an amazing job of starting fire or just causing a lot of trouble. It's just that they sometimes caused as much trouble to the ship firing them as they did the target ship. So probably don't see those too often. But I think that would have been fun to see in here was fire shots. Uh, that might have to be a special rule I come up with. But again, you've got planning of your crew actions. There are critical hits that you can deal with. There's flooding, there's fires. When you play the basic game, there were, the, the whole time I was playing, I kept going, man, 
you know, this would be fun if we were playing with, uh, you know, the, the flooding and different things. But we were really just trying to get the basics down. But those rules are there. You have collisions. There's, oh, they even got rules for aiming high because you're trying to shoot at the rigging. Uh, musketry fire between ships is in the basic game as well. So even that's pretty fun, which has got a little measure right there. But if my ships get close enough, I got rules for musketry fire. There, like I said, there's rules for boarding. Oh, and the maneuvering. Okay, so in the basic game, maneuvering isn't that difficult. You just play with one set of sails. So there's like one common speed among all the ships. But when you play with the advanced rules, there's chances for variable wind strength. The, the wind will change. So, you know, maybe it's blowing northwest this time and now it's blowing, you know, straight north. Um, and then the wind speed. And then you can change your sails. So, depending on a combination of wind speed and your orientation to the wind, you can either have full sails or go all the way down to like backing sails to slow down. So, in just a real simple set of rules, you have a lot of stuff. Oh, there's the islands, there's coastal defenses, shoals for running aground. Um, yeah, the coastal batteries, batteries in combat, rules for solitaire play, which I read, they're okay, but I found some other solitaire options I want to try out, uh, which, which I'll probably show in another video. You got some scenarios here more scenarios. So this even comes with some scenarios for you to play with. Uh, there's the sitting duck scenario. Don't even move the ship. Just say that the enemy ship's at anchor. Save you some headache. But again, kind of going back to some of the, the extra rules. You can you your flagship rule, ammunition explosion, sinking ships, spreading fires, surrendered ships. There's the variable wind direction, which I will use. I might not use all the extra rules. They even had some rules in here for uh, crew action is like giving your crew ale or grog to wipe out some of the uh, crew damage you might have taken. So, so much is here, but because the game is presented in these chits, there's not a lot of paperwork. Uh, the paperwork, yeah, there's a lot of paperwork, but you have markers that indicate everything you want to do. So visually, it's easy to see what you're doing. I think it's very, very cool. So what are we doing with all that cardboard? Well, there's a lot of cardboard here. Now, this this wind gauge is really nice. Uh, see, again, when you play with some advanced rules, you either got a little bit of wind, normal wind, or extra wind. Uh, but, you know, I would say some of the rules don't go as far as damage to the... I didn't see. You know, maybe it's there. But I will say I didn't notice if there was anything about taking extra damage for doing certain maneuvers when you had strong wind and your full sail. Uh, another rule set I have does go into that simulation -y aspect of it. There, there can be damages that happen to your ship when you're trying to do crazy maneuvers in hurricane type weather and you've got full sails out. Um, so I would say that for all the details that it has in the rules, there's probably a few things that a person might say, wow, why don't we have that as well? But I think you could house rule that in. But again, just for what's out of the box, quite a bit of detail. So again, going back to the cardboard that tracks that information for you, this is actually a really good dial. The only thing that I did different was I, this extra piece right here. This is supposed to go between this dial and the board. So this dial is raised up a little bit. But what I found is when I did that, to store it all back and I started putting pieces on, it would pop this away. It just put a lot of pressure on here and uh, I've actually found that this is more secure and holds better if I just put this directly to the dial here, to the gauge, and this the plastic pieces that hold it together. It just works better. So this, if you get the game, I would recommend not use this piece when you construct your little wind gauge. Just put it like this and it, I think it, it's going to work and it stores so much better. So this is your wind gauge. A very simple, just is my wind going to the southeast, east, northeast. Now, the you could actually argue, um, depending on how you play your game, most of the time when we were playing the wind with my son and I, you know, we just put it on one of those cardinal 
uh, you know, one of those those points directly. It was southeast, south, southwest. Uh, a person, if you wanted to, you could have more granularity in here if you wanted. It's just that the way the game plays, I think it was fine just going on the main compass points. Uh, but a person could make subtle in-betweens if you wanted. Because what you do to determine, using your tools here, um, how the wind is affecting the ship, you know, you're going to play this on the board, the, you know, the wind, uh, you're going to point the compass to the north, and then the wind is coming in. And then what you do is you take this, this is kind of the attitude tool, and you would place it, let's say I've got a ship right here. So I know the wind is blowing there, so what I do is I put this on the board, kind of in the direction that the wind is blowing, and then point it at the main mast. And I know I can see right away that's coming at the direct back of the ship. And that's why this is kind of in a hex, I have found is on the, I haven't got it yet, but I was looking at the official Age of Sail mats. They have a bunch of like latitude and longitude lines on there. Uh, they look kind of cool, but those are great ways to line this piece up on those lines so you can get this facing exactly in the compass direction of southeast or south, southwest. That way you're getting more accurate measures. But again, if you're having more free flow with your wind directions, I mean, you could have this thing any way you want as long as you're pointing at the main mast but I was just thinking again within the aspects of the game design a lot of these things just kind of make sense the way it works so if I'm you know if I know the north is that way and the wind is blowing southwest having this on a hex just made it easier for me to identify okay this is blowing south you know um, west or southeast so I got backwards southeast anyway it, the the cardboard is just amazingly well thought out. The only thing that wasn't thought out well was the assembly of these gauges here. Uh, they fit very loose in the plastic that holds this in. So you got a, a little plastic piece that shoots up through the bottom of here and you just rest this in there. So I just took some Elmer's glue and put a little bit of glue down in there, stuck this in, it dries clear, you can't tell it's been glued, but it holds together very well. This was thought out pretty darn well and that holds together well these they weren't thought out as well and they fall apart pretty easy even though there's a storage for them to be stored assembled just drop a little glue on there and then they hold just fine so again the cardboard very very great with the artwork very visually makes me think of napoleonics and the pieces just glue them they hold together you're good all right the ships also again thought out really well on these bases. Uh, I like, you know, they, they, they hold really well. They come off. Uh, this comes apart. Your ship card. And again, these ships usually represent two ships from the class. You just flip it over and it's got the gunnery arcs. It's got some information about like the veer number, the hole strength, their maneuver deck, country of origin, and then, um, you know, the name of the ship. And then down here, this is something. So even these cards are very, very cool because here, this will tell you if you're beating into the wind or if you're, uh, I forget all, but like broad reaching, reaching. So the red means you're facing the wind and you're gonna get blown backwards until you can turn your ship so it's going with the wind again. Orange, uh, you're, you're beating into the wind so you're not going as fast. So some of your maneuvers aren't as you know far distancing on your maneuver cards. And green means you're going with the wind. Now, this was so clever because, again, talking about more complex rule sets, um, yes, I have one where it actually talks about where if the wind is coming up from behind the ship, the ship actually doesn't go quite as fast if it's directly in line with the way the wind is blowing because the back sails tended to block the wind from reaching the front sails. That's why these ships always kind of sail at angles to the wind or if you watch these the sails rotate to try and help catch the wind like these masts actually will rotate and everything like they're very that's what all the rigging is for it helps hold everything up and then it's used to rotate stuff so it's right here very cleverly replicated on the fact that at the very back of the ship is orange so yeah if you're at an angle to the wind you get your green maneuver rating if you're directly with the wind you get the orange 
So there's just little bits of detail that replicate those more complex games, but it's all calculated into these cards. It, it just, it amazes me. Every time I get in here, I'm like, man, this has that rule? And it's just so easily figured out. So that's, again, another part of the, the components that s help you simulate more complex actions, but it's all not on paper. It's just right there as a visual aid. Now, what I did here for the four ships was I created these little packs. I got little snack bags. You've got the board that lays inside of your main ship board. This has all the ship-specific data. And then I put all of the counters for that ship. This includes all of the different ammo types and all the crew actions that you can do. So that way when I want to set up, I don't have to go through one big bag of counters. It's just all stored by ship. So what does a ship look like? All right. Other than the miniature, what does it look like as far as the cardboard goes? So again, helping to simulate all that extra data you might have on the more simulation-y games. It's all right here, but in a nice little whoop. Let's move it in here. And that's good enough. So here you have, again, like the ship hull strength. You've got their maneuver rating, the veer number that will match everything on your card. Here you track your crew. Here you track your, your number of guns that you have. And then here's how many crew actions you have. And as you start to lose crew, you get fewer actions you can do. And what's so cool is it's visually tracked. Oh, I love it. Let me show you here. I'm going to pull out some of these items. This right here, if you had your ship assembled, basically, if I'm playing, say, one of my more complex simulation games, this would be a sheet of paper, and I would have to check off boxes, fill in blanks and whatnot. But all of it's here. Uh, in fact, let me grab a sheet of paper. Oh, it's not quite as wide as a sheet of paper, but if I put it this way, right? So this is a ship tracker log from another game, right? This is uh, Post Captain. Here's crew assignment section. Here's all your plotted movement. Here's where you plot down uh, what your ship can move. So there's a few pieces here. Now, this is only part of the ship log. There's actually a whole other piece I don't quite have here handy. Yeah, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. I said I wasn't going to do a direct comparison, but I'm going to. Uh, because, again, I wasn't trying to say why this is better and why another game sucks. I just want to maybe highlight some differences. So this is one of those more traditional simulation-y games. You've got charts. And there are some out there that have charts for days. But this has got lots of gunnery charts. Uh, all kinds of stuff. And then again, it's a binder full of rules, which is great. A lot of the things that are simulated here in um, Sales of Glory are in here as well, but there's a lot more. There's a lot more uh, rules here for like the boarding. There's a lot of rules that cover boarding where it's not as many, but it still has boarding. Uh, you got your crew tracking. A lot of details as far as moving with the, the wind using these sail gauges and things. So there, there's a lot here. But again, part of the rules is also kind of telling you about what it means to have historical gaming. But anyway, uh, here we go. When you get past all these rules, ship log, there we go. So in addition to this piece of paper where I'm going to track my crew my plot my movement, track some of my other ratings of the ship. I then have this right here, which is tracking the sails, how much sails have been damaged. Uh, here's all the gun types. This is where you track all the damage. So basically, what Sails of Glory have done is they've taken these two pieces of data and shrunk it, if you will, to a board and then visually represents all that data you would have to write out. It's all now done here with these tokens and counters. So I know my sales, I'm at my battle sales. Awesome. Here you've got your ammunition types. So you just put them down here. Here's here's the ammo I'm storing away and I've got, you know, shots over here for 
various, you know, there's like four types of shots. So you just set it up here. And then here's all my crew actions over here. Boom. There it is. I know, it's like a big pile of chits. It is a lot more messy than having it all written on a piece of paper. Like, I'm with you. I get that. Uh, but again, I'm a tactile visual person, so this works fine for me. So here, where I've got to now track my crew as I take crew losses, I have to, because this does it in fractions. So you lose half a crew, and then, and then uh, certain actions require a certain amount of crew. It's, it's a lot of bookkeeping in terms of what your crew are doing. Here on the actions, I got boxes to track reloading and uh, the maneuvering that they do, and I gotta track my sales, and then my sale numbers based on just a lot of stuff, right? But here, okay, if I want a crew to go from increased speed, okay, of my four, well, you have my four crew actions, because I have enough crew to do four things, one's gonna increase speed, these guys are gonna fire those guns, uh, while these folks reload the other gun, and then uh, we got some people that are going to do a repair because we have gotten far away. Boom. Plotted, tracked, and as I take damage, I eventually will have fewer crew to do stuff. Same with the guns. As the ship takes damage, I'm going to have fewer guns to do things with. So all that complexity, that's why I love this game. All that complexity is just funneled down to a nice pure essence that you can track on this one thing. What that does mean though versus say the more traditional game is uh, it takes up a lot more table space if you're going to now manage a lot of ships because you got the maneuver deck and you have this so you've got to have say your maneuver deck off to the side with the ship all of the counters for that ship so what you have to do is if you want to play with more ships so say three per side four per side you can do it you just have to buy more of these uh, frames that come with the appropriate crew counters and action counters to do things. So that might be one drawback to this. Uh, whereas if you want to have more ships, you just got to print out some paper. So advantage, disadvantage, I'm just saying that for me in the small scales that I do, this works great. Uh, this would be a very difficult game to play if you were going to try and do a large fleet action with a bunch of ships. Uh, it would definitely be a lot more difficult because you'd have to buy a lot more components. You, that's right, you'd have to buy a lot more components to play it. Okay, but again, since I'm a visual person, it's awesome. Start your turn and you flip over what you're doing and then in that particular moment of the turn, you would then activate and do all of these actions. So it's really, really cool. These two actions you couldn't do together because they're on the same side of the ship. Um, this even has a little ship indicator telling you uh, if it's port or starboard side. So again, all the little details are just baked into the components. I think it's just very, very cool to me. Now, that's a very basic part of the this, the game, right? That's, that's a small port. So let me just move this aside here. There's more components in the box. I know I feel like I'm rambling, sorry, but I'm just so excited. So I've got the four basic ships are stored in here. Well, that one's shoved down in there. Uh, but there they are. They go in there. When it's all said and done, they mostly fit in there with no problem. And I'm going to, I'd have to put the other ship, I'll have to re. I had these in here really, really nice, but they do fit. They do fit. And then you put your little wind gauge there. It's got a spot to store your little attitude gauge things. Then I put all of the damage tokens here. Now see, this is another thing I thought was very, very cool. Is the damage markers. I'll leave all those in here. I'm just going to play with this. This is, I thought, I actually like this aspect a whole lot. Uh, in my more traditional game, I have a whole lot of charts. I got to roll dice. And then it tells me, you know, based on what I rolled, maybe how many hits there were. And then I got to look down at another chart and you got to roll and it says cross-reference this. And it says, you know, mark off this hit, mark off this hit. And then if there's a critical hit, I got to roll to see what the critical was. You know, which is cool if you like to get into those nuts and bolts and you like the charts and things, I think is great. But the beauty of this is when you are shooting at someone, you're going to, uh, based on your range ruler... 
measure between the two ships. You're going to go from a little measured point here, which is a red dot baked onto the little template of the uh, ship data card, and you measure out to any base on the enemy ship, and wherever that base hits on the color tells you the corresponding damage chits to draw from. So yellow is weaker than the uh, orange. And the orange band here is still for your can as it goes this whole length here. But if you're going to do your grape shot or your chain shot, they do they can be pretty devastating. Uh, but you have to be pretty close to use them. And then that will draw from a... That tells you, am I drawing from the A bag, the B bag, the D bag, the C bag, or if I'm doing musketry fire, which is, you have to be very close, the E bag. And so each of these then has a number of, of hole points you do in damage or will indicate any critical hits or crew. So again, I could either, I'm just replacing, I'm just replacing all of those charts I'm used to using, but they're just baked into what you draw. Now, this is where some people I know I've talked to in the past, they don't like damage chip pull systems because what happens is every time you pull a chit out of the bag, you're changing the composition of the bag and here's what I mean by that. Let's say I'm starting off the game. Uh, brand new game and first shot. Uh, according to this, I was shooting out my front arc of the ship. I got to fire four cannons and I was close enough that I got to draw B damage. So I reveal those on the enemy ship and blah, blah, blah. He says, here's what you've got. And this is actually a pretty good shot actually with the numbers. Killed a lot of crew. This would have been the equivalent of really good dice rolls. But here's the thing. Until this ship is sunk, these four pieces are out of the bag. So just by odds, that means what's left in the bag is fewer chits with crew damage or that many points of damage. Uh, yeah, so I did devastatingly well this time against the person, but now that person returns fire, these are not in there. Um, I've drawn them already, right? So basically, here's what happens. If I draw and say I draw a bunch of zero damage, okay, cool, that means I would have rolled equivalently really bad. But here's the thing. That means now I have left in the bag more damaging chits that could come my way. See, that's the thing is every time you draw a chit, you're changing the averages in the bags from good to bad, good to bad, good to bad. And that can be frustrating to folks. Whereas with just pure dice rolls, then there's, you know, that, that um, I don't know, that, uh, I'm trying to think, that distribution of odds never changes. So I can see the benefit of dice, but I tell you, again, as a visual person, and I roll really crappy on dice, this is fun. You shake up the bag, you look your opponent in the eye, and you start drawing a couple of these things. And you're like, yeah, uh, take that. You throw him at his ship, and he's like, oh, man. But what's cool is because gunnery is simultaneous, what's nice here is uh, you can draw your four chits. You lay them next to the ship, but you don't actually have to apply the damage until all the ships firing have got all their damage chits applied. So this actually makes simultaneous gunnery really nice compared again to my traditional game where I'm going to have to make a lot of notes and things and um, you you apply damage and then it's like, well, i got to roll my damage back. I'm not saying that uh, it's difficult to do simultaneous gunfire with more traditional paper tracked games. I'm just saying this makes that easier. So again, you still have those same elements that you get in your traditional games. They're just visually represented. And I know that doesn't appeal to everyone, but for me, being a tactile visual person I am, this is great. Zeros go down here, and then you look at this damage number, compare it with the ship's strength. This is like their armor in a way. And so you have to equal or exceed that number in damage before you have completely filled in a damage square. See, so an undamaged ship has 464 gunnery. So I'm going to lay them out here from highest to lowest. So here, this is five. Oh, and look, they got a mast hit. And again, there's critical damage that you can track. Sail damage, mast damage, things like that. All visually tracked, it's awesome. And then they have a little 
a special counter I didn't pull out of the box that you could put down here in a critical hit to track that you've got this sale damage going on. But anyway, now that that 5 equals that, you flip it over, and that means I can start putting damage over here. And let's say I didn't have this 5. Let's say I just had a 4. Well, I would put this here, and that means I still have the capacity to absorb some damage before I would flip this over and I'd have to start filling up this box. So the idea, right, is to fill all these boxes up with damage and sink the ship. So if this was really what I drew, I would, that five equals that number, so I would fill this in, and then my next damage would fit here. And then if I had, uh, let's say, a three, well, four by itself does not meet or exceed five, but this three on top of that four makes seven, so together those two would flip, right? So really, the higher your armor value here, that means the ship can take a lot of punishment before it starts to lose its integrity. So that's very, very cool. I can't wait to get some first, some, uh, some first rated ships to see what kind of damage they take. So even tracking the damage really isn't that difficult. Uh, I know my son on one of my smaller ships, he got a, a six, he drew a six in damage, but only had a strength of two. So it's still just filled in one box because whatever damage you have left over doesn't carry over. So if you exceed a box by a whole lot, yeah, that box is gone and I have fewer boxes to fill in, which affects the gunnery. Uh, but at least it's not like you, you don't automatically fill in three boxes from one shot. The way I told him is imagine it like uh, playing World of Warships where you have overpin. The gunnery was so powerful, it just ripped through the ship, got those few important components needed, and then just blew out the other side. So, anyway, um, visually tracked, which is what I love. It's all visually done. Uh, and again, I'm not, you know, having to erase and track things. The only problem is, and then here, like I got crew. So, if I take more crew, then at some point I'll have fewer crew actions I can do and their musketry fire value eventually starts to dwindle because I'm losing crew. And if I lose all my crew, that's one thing I'd, I had to go back and read. I don't remember reading. If you lose all your crew, my understanding is if you lose all the crew here, you're not going to be able to shoot. And you don't have a lot of crew actions to like reload guns. So the ship is kind of effectively dead, but it is just sitting out there. Whereas if you lose all your hull strength, the ship is sunk. So this might be where they strike colors and surrender. So yeah, you gotta be careful about losing the crew. Uh, even though the ship might still have people on it, it might not have enough to actually reload guns, change sails. It just has a very small crew. They're like, yeah, we're done. So this could also represent morale. So again, all of these complex thoughts just in a very nice, tidy little system. Uh, and that's really just kind of the basics. I didn't want to go a whole lot into how to play the game. Again, I wanted to cover why I like the game. Uh, what's cool is if you do play with the more advanced rules, like where you have ships on fire and things like that, the ships actually die much quicker, right? Because they're flooding, they're filling with water. Uh, and there's not much more bookkeeping that you have to do to track all that, because it's going to be done with these little markers to track you know, who's fighting the fire, you know, oh, he's putting out the fire. Oh, they're running the pump to get the water out that got onto the boat. So, again, those complex actions are handled very simply with this counter system. And then that drives the ship. The only other thing that I've actually found I enjoyed more than I thought I would was these movement cards. Yeah, I didn't think I'd be a big fan of this, but actually it turns out pretty good. So with your little ship chart, you can put your little ship there. I found that you don't need to have that there when you play, but it is kind of neat. Like, oh, there's my Charmant class frigate or whatever side you're playing on. There's my Concord class frigate with data. But all the data you need here is on whatever side of the ship you're playing. So not needed, but there is a spot to put your little ship card. Then you're going to do your movement. And what's cool is, and this will probably be the last thing I talk about, is even, you know, they might not have meant it, but it works in really well as far as my other simulation games. So what you're going to do is, based on the speed that you're going, say uh, this has a veer of 5, veer rating of 5, that's how nimble the ship is. So if I play a veer 5 rated card, for instance, like that's what I'm doing, 
Then uh, you always get to plot ahead when you do the advanced rules, you're plotting ahead. You get to put the next maneuver card face down. So you have to kind of play chess and think ahead a little bit. What am I doing? What do I think my opponent's going to do? So that veer rating of five that the ship has means I can go, and these cards are rated from, say, this deck here is from zero all the way out to a ten. So I can shift, based on my veer, uh, five numbers of movement. Okay, so if I played this five, my next card could either be a, all the way out to a 10 or all the way down to a zero. But let's say I did that. Let's say my next maneuver I play face down, I had that as a 10. So while we are doing our, you know, a, revealing what we're doing, I go to my opponent. Yeah, I'm playing this here five card, and the next is a 10. And as long as I'm not violating that, we're cool. Now, I'm then having to look here and go, okay, what do I want to play next? Now I have to plot ahead for the next movement, right? I couldn't play the zero because my veer rating means my ship isn't that nimble. I can't click the brakes and go all the way down to a zero move. I could only go down to a five. If I try to play a zero move, I'd be a violation of the ship's veer rating and the handling. See, so the 10 is going this way drastically. What it's saying is I can't at the drop of a hat swing back around you know like it's not gonna happen you're not gonna be able to do figure eights in the water with this particular ship some ships are pretty nimble and you can come pretty close to that so I think that's pretty cool this handles the ship classes very well within the cards and then how you move the ships I think is also just really easy and not too bad um, I don't I don't have to really think about measuring inches because see that is one thing uh, sometimes when you're playing and you got to measure inches you know there's always room for error not much but the cards help it really lessens that error but depending on the sales I want because again in the more simulation -y games the amount of sale you have out in relation to how much wind there is can affect movement but I don't have to think about it I just know that based on my wind indicator, if the wind is blowing this way, pointing at the, ma the middle mast, I'm in the green. So I'm going to use the ship will move out to this green value. If I'm you know, into the wind a bit or it's coming across, then I'm in the orange value. And then if I'm trying to sail into the wind, they have some special cards for going backwards. So it's really, really easy at a glance to tell what my ship can do and how far it's going to move. And then you've got, um, when you go to line it up, there's a little black notch on the front. You just line the black notch up with the front of the ship. And then you got to hold the card. And this is probably the only real fiddly part of the whole thing. With a ruler, yeah, you can just kind of lay the ruler there, move it, and you're done. Here, it is a little bit of a pain because i got to line up the card, try not to bump the ship hold the card down, and then move the ship. But then I've got my maneuver. Just boom, line it up like that, and you're done. You know, if I was doing orange or green speed. Whereas other games, though, when you get into simulation, you want to do turns. There's turn templates and other things you got to do. So both systems have fiddliness when it comes to moving and turning ships. But I've just found, in general, that these cards are actually really really nice when it comes to turning and maneuvering your ships as far as you know rotating them on arcs and things like that it's just built into the card built into the veer value of your vessel compared with the uh, wind speed and how much sail you have it's so cool so easy now this is the other part i think is cool see in some of my more simulation -y games you can't just go from moving one way and make a turn. There's always a little bit of, you have to move forward a little bit and uh, to break the inertia of the direction you're going or to go from a straight line, break that inertia so you can turn. That's built into here with that veer value. Because see, I can't just go from turning that direction to turning this direction. So that a little bit of delay in traveling as far as you know breaking inertia, what you can do, is actually kind of built into the system with that veer value. So again, complex concepts uh, you know, simply mimicked here in just one little aspect of the game. Boom. The veer rating, the veer rating numbers on your cards and what you can do. Um, that's probably the last big thing I want to talk about. So yeah. Am I happy with the game? I really am. This is actually really good. Uh, the base game 
this this is not a fleet game. It really is designed for having two or three ships per person. Three ships, uh, you, you could probably do, if you're real familiar with the rules, you could probably do three versus three. Two versus two is a real sweet spot, but I, I think three versus three would be good because um, there was times where I was playing with my son with just the two ships out of the box, and I was like, man, I wish I had one more ship to fill this gap where where we were maneuvering. So I think that's what I'll do is buy one more ship. I'm going to get it, like I said, a, a first rate ship of the line and then uh, the extra ship pack. And then we'll do like three versus three or at least maybe one versus one on these two big, you know, first rate ships. But yeah, I like it. I'm very happy with this. I'm not, I don't regret this purchase at all. I have to admit, sometimes I purchase a game or a company will send me a game and I'm like, man, I kind of wish... I hadn't got that, uh, but this one I paid for, and I don't regret it one bit. So I'm gonna put some stuff back. Uh, yeah, that that sums it up right there. Now, hopefully, that tells you why I like the game and pointed out something that maybe I didn't like. So, what else do I like about the game? Well, for the base box, let's let's end it there. What I want to do is go back to the community support. Community support is fantastic. You can go on to, say, Board Game Geek, go to the file section for the game, and you'll see people have made quick reference sheets. And I'm going to show you... I took them out because I didn't want... Or I, of course, I set them off somewhere where I can't reach them. But, um, yeah, I, there are community-made files out there for things. And um, I printed out a quick reference sheet that has... You know, basically all the phases of the game, and on one side it's got what all the different uh, damage effects are to help you track like flooding and fires and stuff like that, uh, which is very nice. Just having it on a sheet that I can flip. It also had a sheet it for the optional rules, so that was very cool. I mean, it's all in the book, but just having it on a quick reference sheet, so I carry you know two pieces of paper, two double-sided pieces of paper versus my whole book was nice. Also, as far as the community, I didn't print it out yet, but somebody made a really cool um, paper that is basically this data board just on a sheet of paper. So instead of having all the cardboard chits, if you wanted to go paper, you would print it out. And what's cool is it's form fillable. So depending on the ship that you have, you can type in all these values for the gunnery and like the musketry ratings and then just track everything on on that paper which I thought was very very cool so there's even a paper version of this you can do uh, another cool thing I wanted to show and I haven't got this to work yet that's just me because I'm not very technical savvy but I found this it is on the App Store it's the Sales of Glory Solo software and I really am trying to figure out how to make this work but when when it works and I'm told it does you basically it will tell you what the enemy ship is going to do uh, this is actually a little bit clumsy in using and I think it would be very hard to do like a three versus three or a two versus two I think this would work good if you're doing one ship versus another kind of a thing but I mean, the reason why is you gotta fill in the ship info for each ship so you gotta do the ship solo type uh, burden higher than three so it's a big ship uh, clip for the got to put in the veer rating so the ship has a veer rating of five for instance like if I'm doing this defense the main target that I'm shooting at it's shooting at another ship that's got a higher than five burden then I got to do the distance now this does I have to measure so let's say I am six inches away from my opponent's ship relative heading it's um, off in this direction here it says relative heading is 90 to 135 degrees to the right so it's you know over here somewhere um, select previous maneuver veer rating because again this has to track the card data so I'd say well my previous veer I did a, a three maneuver was chosen closest point playing area because again it doesn't want to sail your ships off the board so I'd say the closest playing zone is 11 inches away then the wind situation. I'm a solo ship is beating, so it's already facing into the wind. Here's what the crew actions are doing. Because again, in order to give this uh, appropriate advice, you gotta fill all this in. So what cannons are loaded? Um, all cannons are loaded. I can do a maximum of four crew actions. 
their previous repair soul ship is already repaired it hasn't uh, let's see here it has already repaired normal oh soul ship has not repaired anything so we haven't had to do any repairs you pick your sales I'm at full sales we didn't struck them we didn't strike them we are not going back we just say let's say they're at full sales there are secondary targets no secondary targets the crew running uh, crew is not doing anything because we just started the game let's just say crew is crew is not busy then any damage okay there's no fire it's not leaking ship has no leak or water because if it was not leaking or had water the the AI might determine that it wants to pump water so let's do that the ship has no leak but it still has some water the masts are good no damage on the masts uh, no cell damage we'll find out because maybe there was no cell damage it has one or no cell damage rudder rudder is fine so ship has at least one so ship has no damage because then it could repair so compute the crew actions uh, they're gonna pump water see so I can that's what the crew is doing but okay so here's the maneuver and this is the part that's broke uh, so I could get just the maneuver or I can do the crew action. See, the crew action part works but this maneuver part I haven't quite got that to work yet oh there it is I had to select a maneuver but there, there you go see if you get it working right boom this will tell you play this card see isn't that cool so the community has thrown out a lot of really cool support things for the game so I love it I just had to figure out this zone oh there's there's rules for instructions there how to use it which I should probably read better so I understand how to do that but that's what's so cool this will tell you not only what the crew action will do because that's sometimes you know as you're as you're playing you, you gotta decide for your ship what you want to do uh, but if you're doing solo play you don't necessarily want to have to take the time to, to figure all that for the opponent this will do that for you and it'll pick a maneuver so I can either just pick out the maneuver or tell what the crew is doing I guess if you're just doing the maneuver part you could do this for multiple ships you just gotta fill it in a little bit but that's so cool that is so neat uh, so again amazing amount of community support a lot of your complex rules from your more complex games are in here yeah there's probably gonna be some things I mean gosh if you really wanted to get into what brand of tobacco the crew is smoking that day yeah that's not in here that might be another but you know what they do have in here the drinking the grog yeah I did mention that earlier so uh, yeah there might be some minutia that you find in another game but I'm sure an astute community member could make rules for things like someone did have rules for uh, rolling dice for damage I saw uh, they had a nice chart. You roll a die 6 and a die 10 cross-reference, and that tells you what damage you took, so you're not drawing the counters. Um, also, another one said, hey, how come we don't have chaser cannons? Right? These things could shoot straight ahead. Some of the forward guns could shoot forward, right? Or maybe out the back. So my rule for that, there, someone else made some rules too, but mine was I'm just going to take half the value of that forward arc, and that's what I can shoot forward. So as my ship takes damage, you know, and round down. So at some point, I can't shoot forward anymore. Or I'm only shooting one gun, you know, I'm only drawing one chit when I shoot forward at somebody, right? So that was my easy way to make chasers. Only problem was, what's the arc of fire on there? It's pretty limited. <laughs> There's no, it's not pre-marked, so I would have to decide exactly where I'm going to do my arc of fire out the front for the chasers but it's pretty limited uh, but so again things that you might find missing are really easy to mod into the system and there it is we've been talking about this game for an hour that is about I probably could go on more but we're gonna go ahead and cut it there so please leave in the comments what you don't like about the game what do you like about the game I already know some people have taken their miniatures and they've using them with other rule systems but I tell you what I'm really liking this but again this is for small actions this is not gonna work for big fleets 
I've seen it though, but that would be like one person per ship. So if you want to have like one person that controls multiple ships, that's not this rule set. But if you want to control two, maybe three ships, then I think this is fantastic with the detail and the minutia of getting in there, managing your crew and damages for your ships. But let's leave it at that. And uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you later. Bye.